morning, afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sandrine Bayeux. Um, I work as a staff software engineer at ARM, and uh, I've, I work on the Trusted Firmware A uh, open source project. Uh, I've been working on this project for uh, quite a, uh, some years, from the beginning of uh, the creation of the project, in fact. And so this is going to be the subject of this presentation. Um, we're going to give you a technical overview of this project. Uh, so I'm co-presenting uh, this with uh, Joanna Fali, uh, who is the engineering manager uh, in my team. And without further ado, I'm going to uh, um, head, I mean, um, hand it over to her. Thank you, Sandrine. So, um, as Sandrine said today, we're um, presenting the Trusted Firma A class project, and I'm going to be giving you a, a brief overview of some of our base features, and then Sandrine will take over towards uh, the middle of the presentation to give you an update on some of our more recent uh, features that we're, we're, we're either currently working on or just delivered. So, as I said, it's, I'm going to give a, uh, an indication of the foundational features. So, what is Trusted Firmware A class? So, TFA, as it is often known for short, is a reference implementation of the uh, of firmware for the ARM A class processors. So, A as in the application class. So, this is Cortex A for client devices, and Neoverse for um, the infrastructure uh, device market. Uh, a lot of our work with this reference implementation requires us to work closely with um, a group that produced within ARM that produces software and architecture and hardware specifications. And what we try to do is provide a, a reference implementation that is compliant to these standards. So the, the project has been going approximately since 2013, so roughly seven years now. And it's a, a reference implementation of the ARM Trust Zone architecture. Um, that has two states. And as you can see in the diagram, that's the normal world and the secure world. As well as the, the two different worlds, we have these what are called ELs or exception levels that uh, represent uh, the levels of privileges that are available at those, at those um, exception levels. And as you can see in the diagram, you've got uh, applications and the kernel hypervisor, and then uh, at the, the highest EL level, we've got the firmware. So typically, um, uh, the relationship between the normal and the secure world is a master-slave relationship, where the normal world communicates to the secure world through the SMC layer, and that's the um, secure monitor call layer. Um, this is a defined specification, um, as I mentioned, uh, um, that ARM produces that uh, indicates uh, how parameters should be passed through registers and the return value. And it's a synchronous exception model. So for the TFA project, the, the bits outlined in with the purple line are the um, the, the components that are included in the, the source code of, um, of the TFA project. And the goal is to provide a, a foundation for a trusted execution environment in the secure world. So it's an isolated execution environment. It's a higher level of security. And um, this is where trusted OSs and uh, trusted applications can normally provide services from to the normal world. So the code is designed to be reusable uh, for different platforms. And what we have is uh, some core code as well as uh, platform code that has been upstreamed from consumers of the, of the repository. And it's approximately 350,000 lines of, of code. About a third of it is the core code, and the other two thirds are the various different up, upstream platforms, of which there's about 30 coming from approximately 15, 16 plus uh, vendors. The code is 90% um, uh, C and 10% assembler code. And there are many build options to support different aspects of the, of the architecture. It is uh, released under the uh, BSD3 clause. So there's almost unlimited uh, freedom to, to consume 
uh, the, the the code base, and so it's very consumer friendly. And we also take contributions under the developer certificate of origin that allows um, a more relaxed um, uh, contribution uh, model than uh, having to go through any sort of legal contract to release uh, patches and, and code to the repository. Uh, since around about 2018, um, it's uh, been a transition to the trustedfirma.org um, organization as a, an open governance project as opposed to an arm run open source project. Um, and TFA is a number of uh, one of a number of, um, of firmware projects that is under this umbrella. Um, it's not the objective of this presentation to talk about all of those, but I, I would uh, urge people interested to go to the trustedfirma.org site and uh, explore the other offerings that are available there. We, um, we have uh, approximately um, a six month release cycle. So um, we, we have a single master tree that uh, we tag uh, with a very lightweight process for when we do releases. And um, we have an ongoing CI continuous integration system that, that helps maintain the quality patch by patch as they're uh, merged into the project. You may notice there's a, there's a gap um, uh, to EL2 in the secure world level. And one of the features that uh, Sandrine will be talking about later will be this uh, secure partition manager, which is a new capability that is being provided. So if we look at uh, the boot flow, um, we have a number of BLs or bootloader images that uh, are provided. Um, so um, the first BL1 and BL2 are very transitional, uh, sorry, transient um, uh, images that uh, are only last uh, around for a period of time until we can get to the BL31 image, which is the persistent uh, uh, image that, uh, that you saw in the previous diagram. So BL1 is the first um, code executed um, and it's pulled from ROM and it, it provides a minimal level of uh, initialization to be able to authenticate the BL2 image, which is an updatable image and uh, also hand off to that image. So the BL2 image uh, provides uh, some additional uh, initialization and again, it loads and authenticates the persistent um, firmware image, uh, the runtime resident um, uh, BL31. BL31, um, also known as the EL3 monitor firmware, uh, its primary purpose is to handle the transitions between the normal and the secure worlds and offers runtime services. There are other images that are um, outside the remit of the TFA project in the diagram and also shown here. And uh, these are commonly the, the BL32, which is um, um, the trusted OS in the secure world, and also BL33, which is normally a, a normal world bootloader that often leads to the, you know, the booting of a rich OS like Linux or Android or a hypervisor. The boot flow has the capacity to have a more platform specific images to be um, created, but uh, that, that isn't part of the, the core code that's up to the, the various platform providers. So trusted boot. So previous slide, I, I talked about the boot flow, but one of the big aspects of this project, and it's, it's hinted at in the name, is that we need to trust the boot process. And it's all about trust. And um, there's another um, uh, ARM standard that uh, architectural standard that we, we we look to be compliant with, and that is the TBFU, the Trusted Boot Firmware Update. And this allows the um, design of um, a more trustworthiness uh, mechanism through something called the chain of trust for the firmware images. And this is where um, the, the different images are signed with a, a key, uh, a, a cryptographically private key that is used to sign all the firmware binaries. And then uh, as you go through the, uh, the boot process, that can be um, verified with the public key. So, that, so the, the images are signed with the uh, root of trust public key, the ROTPK, and uh, 
that is available from uh, the BL1 uh, for verification, and that is in the um, um, the, the the ROM image that uh, that, that originates the, the boot process. Key here is to note that if any of these authentication um, steps actually fail, we we stop at that level and we we, we fail to and we we we, we stop to and refuse to boot. There's a, an optional cryptographic hardware option that could be used that might be more efficient than some devices for the soft, rather than software verification on the CPU. So multiple sign-in domains is a, is a mechanism where we can have multiple um, routes of trusts um, for, for different images. And it's a mechanism that's currently under development and it better reflects an ecosystem that's made up of multiple silicon providers, o, ODMs, OEMs, and o, OSVs, where different images might be coming from different sources. And uh, it, it helps to um, alleviate the problem of everybody having to uh, use a common route of trust. In addition to the firmware sign-in, um, sorry, the firmware image sign-in at build time and verification at load time, we can have um, image encryption at build time and decryption at load time. Power management is, a, is another key aspect that's architected and specified uh, in, in the ARM architecture. And this is the uh, PSCI um, specification, the power state coordination interface. And here it's key that the, the software images must interoperate when, when power is being managed. So this is for core idle management, dynamic addition and removal of cores, secondary core boot, and system shutdown and reset. And TFA provides a PSCI runtime service that provides this, this, this management um, to the lower level ELs through the SMC calls. There is the, on some devices the possibility of having a separate um, microcontroller processor, often referred to as the system control processor that, that performs and has responsibility for the power management functions. As I said, this may not be present on all designs. And um, for interfacing to this, um, there is a system control and management interface um, uh, standard specification that is used and this specifies uh, the interface for power domain, performance, clock, sensor, and reset domains from various functions. And the TFA code base provides a compliant reference implementation of uh, via an SCMI driver. And uh, in, in this particular model, all, all power uh, management is delegated to the SCP through that interface. Another aspect that's quite important is exception handling. So um, the specification, uh, the SDEI, uh, the Software Delegation Exception Interface, is uh, it's a standard for um, delivering critical system events. The TFA provides a compliant reference implementation of this. And uh, again, it's managed through a SMC calls um, where you can register callbacks from the, I, the OS and uh, hypervisor uh, from the um, uh, upper levels of the, uh, the ELs. And um, when triggered, uh, exceptions are passed to and serviced by those, uh, the OS and hypervisor. Um, when these uh, events are triggered, it's expected that they will preempt any critical sections and in, in those uh, in the, the OS or hypervisor layer. It's important to note that uh, not, not shown here is a more general firmware interrupt management handling system. Um, uh, and these, these systems need to coexist. So platforms through the SDEI can make use of two levels of event priority and uh, they can be either hardware or software generated. You know, examples could be uh, hardware failures, say, um, you know, for every corrected memory failure, 
or you or they could be in the in the in the the, the ability to do profiling say for instance so you could profile when, when every 100 smc calls are being uh, performed or have been processed or it could be for debugging uh, a debug uart event uh, is, is another type of exception in the current implementation of tfa we we do support um platform error handling through ras reliability availability and serviceability routing ras events uh up to the normal world to be be handled So the ARM architecture is constantly evolving. Um, hardware architecture updates are generally uh, provided yearly. Uh, they often blog about in around the September time zone uh, time range, and um, they are then made of more formally available in the uh, the ARM ARM the the ARM architectural reference manual in the following spring. And these various features, uh, you know, support uh, the usage of the um, the ARM and V8 architecture in um, in multiple types of markets, whether they're client devices like phones and laptops, infrastructures like servers, network switches, IoT, smart edge devices, and automotive, um, so vehicles. The TFA code base um, and repository evolves to support these new architectural features as necessary. Um, Features are added to the master branch um, as they're implemented. But as you can see on this slide, we, we actually sort of, in our six month tagging, we sort of formalize their availability. Uh, so um, that is a, a, a rundown of some, some of the base features that uh, TFA um, provides. And I'm now gonna pass back to Sandrine to uh, give you more ideas of some of the newer features that we're working on. Thank you, Joanna. Um, so the first feature um, that I'd like to talk about is the idea of making the firmware more generic. So the situation today is that um, whenever you compile your firmware, um, you compile it for a specific platform. Um, and that binary only runs on this specific platform. It won't work on another one. And that's because all the platform information um, is expressed through a number of platform header files. Um, you can see an example of this on the right hand side, uh, where we have the ARM um, platform header files defining stuff like uh, the memory map, uh, the interrupts, uh, some of the device settings and so on. So all this information is built into uh, the firmware, and that makes a specific binary, um, a binary specific to your platform. And what we'd like to do is to have instead a single firmware stack that is able to run across a range of platforms. So this is not a new idea. Uh, I'm sure all of you are aware that that's how it works in the Linux kernel today. Um, in the, you usually compile your Linux image for a spe specific architecture, for example, ARM64, and then it runs on all ARM64 platforms, um, provided that you have the right device tree uh, for your platform. Uh, so we'd like to do something very similar for the trusted firmware and move all differentiating configure configuration options to a configuration file that the firmware would parse at boot time to self-configure itself for this specific platform. Now, uh, we realize that um, such a, a feature is not, is not free. Uh, it does have a performance overhead because obviously you need uh, the code that will parse uh, the, the configuration file. It also increases the memory footprint uh, to uh, you know, include this, this additional code in the image and also to load the configuration file. And it just adds more complexity um, to the firmware. So it, for some of the devices, for example, highly constrained devices, um, this is not something that might be desirable. They might still want to continue uh, having a 
tailored uh, firmware for their platforms. But even for these devices, um, we believe that it would be a good idea to use configuration files to express platform data anyway, uh, because we could have a tool uh, that runs on the build host machine that passes the configuration file and generates the platform header file um, that um, that I've uh, shown um, at the beginning of this slide. And that way, uh, all platform data is expressed through the same mechanism, uh, configuration files, rather than having a mix of configuration file and platform header files. So, uh, right now, we are using the device tree format for these configuration files, and we're using the libfdt to pass them at runtime. Uh, now, we might support alternate formats in the future, but for now, it's the only one. So along, uh, just to give you uh, uh, an idea of the kind of information that we would like to move uh, in this configuration file. So aside from the traditional hardware configuration you would typically find in a Linux kernel uh, device tree, like uh, the CPU topology, uh, some of the devices, uh, base addresses or settings, uh, we could express uh, secure firmware features, for example. So Joanna talked about trusted boot uh, previously. Um, Having having a um, a boolean flag uh, uh, that you can just toggle in this configuration file can be quite handy when when you are in development mode, because it enables you to enable or disable it uh, uh, without recompiling your firmware. Uh, similarly, uh, you could uh, have the log level uh, in this configuration file to control the verbosity of the messages printing or printed on the UART or the location of the images that the firmware needs to load and authenticate. Um, this configuration file could be used also to pass information from uh, one firmware stage to the next, or even to uh, uh, the Linux kernel or, or the bootloader. Uh, examples of that would be some memory that we have probed, um, and we want to avoid the next firmware stage to probe it all over again. So we could just pass this information in the configuration file. Or if we reserve some, some uh, memory, secure memory region, and we want to tell to the Linux kernel that uh, it, it's something uh, that it should avoid accessing because it's secure memory. That's that's another thing we could put in the, in the file. Uh, the last category of um, options uh, we could put is like um, configuration of a specific firmware component. Uh, DDR training parameters is a prime example because we've seen examples of platforms that are extremely similar and they not only differ on the way they need to train the DDR. So if we move this uh, information to the file again, you can use the same firmware across the two platforms. So. I'm sure um, most of you were already familiar with this concept, so I would just like to uh, give a bit more details about how we've implemented that in the trusted firmware, just to give a, a different perspective. Um, so we've based this code on the uh, firmware configuration framework, uh, or fconf. That's a data abstraction layer uh, to access this configuration data. So basically, we have uh, different modules, as you can imagine, in the trusted firmware, the power management module, uh, the, 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 the IO layer module. And uh, some of these modules will want to, um, con to consume some of the data uh, that is inside the configuration file. So the way they would do that is that they would register a callback responsible for extracting the configuration data they are interested in. So here you've got an example uh, where we call the fconf register populator macro. Uh, and we want to extract the topology information out of the uh, hardware configuration file. And that extraction is done by the fconf populate topology callback that the module has to provide. Um, for each call to the to this fconf register populator macro, 
it actually registers the callback in a specific linker sections. So all the callbacks are gathered in this section. So when the trusted firmware boots, um, the configuration data needs to be parsed. So every callback that has been registered in the linker section is called. And each one of them uh, will go and parse the device tree and extract the information it needs. So here we've got an example where you could have a device tree with a CPU's node uh, and the fconf populate topology callback is responsible for passing this node. Uh, it knows the bindings uh, of this specific node, so it, it can find the information it wants, and then it, it will populate a global data structure, in this case, the struct hardware topology, um, with the different information it, it wants to keep. Uh, later on, uh, all the, the different module can query the global configuration data that has been extracted at step two. Uh, one example here is uh, by calling this fconf get property and saying, I want to retrieve the topology information out of the hardware configuration information, and more specifically, the plat cluster count information. And that's the way it will get uh, this uh, specific piece of information. Now, I've mentioned that um, this feature is not necessarily interesting for highly constrained devices because of the performance and memory footprint overhead it adds. But even for these platforms, uh, some of these structures st stays the same uh, because the global data structure, uh, like the strict hardware topology, can still be provided by the platform layer, um, like uh, static data. Um, and the way the rest of the code uh, would want to access uh, this configuration data does not change. It's still going through this fconf get property uh, macro, uh, whether this information is con has been extracted from a configuration file or whether it's provided statically by the platform layer. So that's why in that sense, uh, fconf is a, is, a, is a data abstraction layer to access this data. So now the second uh, piece of development we've been working on lately uh, that I want to talk about is uh, some work we've been doing to re-architect the Secure World software. So first of all, let's take a look at how things look like today. So here you've got a diagram of a typical software stack. Uh, on the left-hand side, you've got the normal world. Uh, where you've got your um, um, uh, user land applications running, serviced by your kernel, and potentially man managed by your hypervisor, if you've got one. And, uh, and on the right-hand side, uh, you've got the secure world where the trusted firmware runs. So the trusted firmware runs at EL3, which is the highest level of privilege in the system. And uh, as Joanna has already explained, uh, one of the duties of the firmware is to provide some runtime services. Some of them are secure services, like uh, secure payment, secure storage, and some of them are platform services, like trusted boot, uh, power management, or even some silicon vendor services. So these services would be typically specific to your system on chip. So that makes up for quite a lot of services uh, in your firmware. And as you can imagine, it increases uh, the code complexity uh, and also increases the attack surface, which is not good from a security point of view, because remember, it's, uh, uh, it's running at the highest level of privilege. So if you find uh, um, um, if you find a, a flow in, in the firmware that you can exploit, you basically uh, you rule uh, the system. Um, and the second issue is that it increases uh, the fragmentation because, as I as I said, you've got some platform services inside it which are specific to your SOC. So that goes against our uh, our desire to have a generic firmware here. Now, 
it, still looking at how the architecture looks today, if you can have a trusted OS running in the secure world uh, to manage some trusted applications. And uh, typically, uh, when you've got this architecture, the trusted OS takes over all the secure services, like secure payment, secure storage. And so what's left in terms of services in the trusted firmware is only the platform services. So it 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 makes the 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 uh, code bloat uh, a bit a code bloat issue a bit less um, uh, important yeah, because your firmware is a bit smaller, uh, but it doesn't solve all issues. It, it, it even brings new ones. Um, so the first one is that the trusted firmware. Um, is typically provided by a different vendor than the trusted OS. And prior to ARMv8.4, um, there was no hardware isolation provided between secure EL1 and EL3. So in other words, between the trusted OS and the trusted firmware which means that, for example, the trusted OS can see just as much memory uh, as the trusted firmware. It can access any address. Um, there's no way to have, uh, for example, some memory that would be specifically mapped for ER3 and uh, forbidden to the trusted OS. So that means that the trusted OS vendor and the trusted firmware uh, provider have to trust each other, basically which is not always possible. Um, the second issue is that whenever you start using a specific trusted OS, you also need some companion uh, components all over the software stack. So these are the green boxes in this uh, diagram. You can see that you need a specific driver uh, in your kernel uh, in your um, normal world kernel to talk to this specific trusted OS. Same for your hypervisor if you've got one. And you also need some code in the trusted firmware uh, that is responsible for recognizing and uh, delegating the secure monitor calls that are targeting this specific trusted OS. So the model we would like to move to instead is to uh, move all services upper the exception levels. So to take them out of the trusted firmware and move them, for example, at secure EL0. That way, the firmware is a lot more smaller. Um, so the, the attack surface is reduced. The complexity of the code is reduced as well. And that, in turn, makes it easier to audit and certify the firmware if you need to. Also, um, what you, the, the only remaining services that you've got in your firmware are standard services, such as the trusted boot, the power management, or the secure monitor call um, uh, handler. Uh, because all the remaining uh, platform-specific data are expressed through configuration files. Um, um, if we use the, the FCOM framework I've been talking about uh, just before. So that makes for a truly uh, generic trusted firmware that can run across any platform. Now, um, it, it, the, the, what I've just explained on the previous slide solved the code bloat issue. The other issue, if you remember, was the fact that the trusted OS and the firmware, had, there is no isolation between them. So to solve this issue, um, you, uh, we can leverage the um, ARMv8.4 extensions and more specifically, uh, the secure virtualization. So in ARMv8.4, we now have virtualization in the secure world. As Joanna mentioned in one of the previous slides, there's now a new exception mod uh, sorry, a new exception level, which is secure EL2. And that gives us an opportunity to put some firmware code uh, in this exception level to isolate EL3 from secure EL1. Um, 
The other piece of the puzzle is also to standardize the interfaces, the communication interfaces between the different uh, components in the stack. If you remember the previous slide, I've explained that uh, when you've got a specific trusted OS, you need specific drivers to talk to this trusted OS. That's because each trusted OS do it, does it its own way. But if we standardize the communication interface, then uh, you just need a driver that implements um, this specification in a standard way and uh, and uh, and the problem is solved. So that's achieved through uh, an ARM specification called PSA FFA, which I will talk more in a second, um, that, you, that you can see in the blue boxes uh, at the different uh, software uh, boxes boundaries. Uh, so that way, we can have generic code running both in EL3 and secure EL2. Now, I would like to just give a bit more details about um, some of the building blocks in this architecture. Uh, so on the left hand side, you've got a diagram that is basically the same as on the previous slide. Um, so first uh, building block, uh, is on the on the top uh, the the trusted OS uh, with the, with its trusted applications and um, the platform services. So these are two uh, what we call secure partitions. So a secure partition is a software sandbox that runs in the secure world, and uh, it's a sandbox because it's got its own execution context and its own address space um, isolated from uh, other secure partitions. So um, that, that makes it possible if you've got uh, several providers for your um, secure partitions, uh, they don't need to trust each other um, uh, because uh, they know that uh, there will be no unintended um, inter uh, communication between uh, different uh, secure partitions. The second building block here is this blue, blo blue box where you've got the SPM or Secure Partition Manager. So that's part of the secure EL2 firmware. And its responsibility is to initialize all the secure partitions at boot time and uh, to enable the communication between the service requestors and the providers and manage their re requests at runtime. Um, one, one other key role of the SPM is to enforce the pr principle of least privilege. Because when the SPM sets up the execution context and the address space of a secure partition, uh, it will just um, uh, give it the minimum that it needs to see. So it will, um, it will set up the translation tables of this specific, uh, secure partition such that the address space the secure partition sees is just what the, what it needs not more. Same for uh, the physical interrupts. They are directly managed by the secure EL2 firmware and they won't be um, uh, forwarded to a secure partition if this partition is not supposed to know about this specific interrupt. Um, so in terms of implementation, uh, we currently have in the Trusted Firmware A project uh, an initial version of an SPM dispatcher that is compliant to the PSA FFA specification I talked about uh, before. So um, the PSA FFA stands for Platform Security Architecture Firmware Framework for A-Class Processor. Uh, the PSA is actually um, um, a class, uh, a range of documents, and so FFA is just one of them. Uh, so it, it's a standard set of interfaces uh, between uh, secure partitions and the secure partition manager on one side, and also between the secure partitions and the normal world. 
And um, going back to the status, uh, the implementation, we, we've got um, an initial secure EL2 firmware that is based on the Hafnium project, uh, which you might have heard about. Uh, it used to be a, a Google project, but it's been migrated into trustedfirmware.org this year to serve as the reference secure EL2 uh, SPM of choice. So these were two um, quite recent uh, pieces of development we've been working on. Uh, there are more than, than, than just these two. Uh, so if you want to find more about uh, the projects, uh, here are some useful links. Um, so we've got um, a mailing list, uh, a public mailing list for technical discussion. Uh, we are also organ organizing um, a call every other week uh, with the community that anyone can join to discuss uh, anything. Um, here is a link also to browse the source code and to the Garrett server we use for code reviews. Um, we've also got quite uh, extensive uh, documentation uh, of the project that is hosted on Read the Docs. And uh, we've got a, a test suite um, that is also open source um, to exercise the trusted firmware. And finally, uh, if you want to find out more about the trustedfirmware.org um, initiative in general, not, specific for, not specifically for TFA, uh, here is where to find the monthly project status update and the board meeting min minutes. So thanks a lot uh, for attending. And uh, I guess we're ready to take uh, any questions then. Hello. Um, I, I believe that we have around about uh, four questions in the list at the moment, and uh, I can, if I take them from the, the top, I think uh, that might be the best uh, best approach. So the first question is, how well are the silicon vendors upstream in the uh, SOC support? Well, as, as mentioned in the first slide, there are, there's, a, there's approximately uh, 30 plus uh, platforms now upstreamed from about 16 uh, plus vendors um, it you know when the project started of course um, you know, the, the the number of upstream platforms was minimal but uh, as time has gone by since uh, uh, 2013 you know we, we get you know a number of new platforms uh, uh, for every six month release that we we, we talked about and um, well, what we do is we provide or we, we nominate uh, from from the people upstream and a platform owner and we um, work with that person who's responsible for upstreaming their their changes. Um, a lot of the discussion goes on in Garrett, uh, where there's um, you know patch reviews. But we also have a quite a, a busy mailing list where folks talk about uh, you know the, their ideas and uh, issues that they're having with the platforms. And as also mentioned by Sandrine in the last slide, there's a biweekly tech forum, and this is a live call that we host. Where we um, discuss the um, uh, any issues, as well as presenting new ideas and uh, and so forth, um, you know, that's going on in the project. Um, so I, I I would think um, you know you, you ask how well I think uh, I think it is going reasonably well with the platforms. Um, so the next question was, um, what is the actual motivation for the generic firmware idea? Um, so, um, th the idea is really, uh, that, um, some platforms have, uh, very few differences, actually. Uh, one of the examples that was, uh, explained in the slides were, uh, like you've got, um, pretty much the same hardware, but it's just different ways to train your DDR, uh, with different settings. Um, so in this case, it's, it's not always very, um, convenient to have two builds uh, of, the, of the firmware with just the settings that change um, um, that, that you have to deploy on, on both platforms. Instead, it's just uh, more convenient and easier to move that to some configuration file that is read and you, you get the same binary and ju you just have to to change the configuration file uh, depending on the platform that you, you, you want to deploy the firmware on. So that, that's really the idea. 
hopefully that answers the question. Um, the next one was, uh, where is the configuration data stored and how do you validate its integrity? Does it need to be signed? Uh, so the configuration data is stored along uh, the firmware binaries, uh, usually in some kind of uh, flash or non-volatile memory, um, secure storage, or, or not, not necessarily secure storage, in fact, um, because yes, it, it is signed. Uh, so it could be in non-secure flashed. Um, and uh, if you enable trusted boot, uh, which is an optional feature, um, then all the images in the boot flow are signed and verified at, at runtime, including the configuration data file. Um, so question number five was, what is the advantage of power management in secure world? Um, so the idea of putting PSCI in the trusted firmware at ER3 in the secure world is that um, usually um, power management is driven by the um, rich OS, I mean, the, the normal world OS like uh, Linux. Um, and um, But you might also have a, a trusted OS running uh, on your platform. And if, if, the, if Linux decides that it wants to shut down some CPU, um, well, the trusted OS might need to be notified of that in order to do some context saving before uh, the CPU gets turned off. And so um, this coordination uh, task is taken care of by the firmware. So Linux will ask, please uh, turn off the CPU. And then the trusted firmware, make sure that any anyone in the secure world that needs to be aware of that before that happens is notified. So that's really um, a coordination role. So question six is, are there guidelines how to coordinate access to components that need to be accessed by TFA and Linux? Um, I don't know what you think, Sandrine, but uh, I, I think because we have a, a number of um, standards that um, that we we work to and we implement these APIs, they're also implemented, or a number of them are implemented by the the kernel as well. Uh, well, typically, I would expect that a, a device is um, either owned by the kernel or by TFA, but uh, there is no. I mean, if there is. If both of them need to um, coordinate somehow because they manage part of a device only, um, then they would need, uh, yeah, so, some kind of uh, communication mechanism. Um, but um, I, I'm not aware of any standard from ARM or anything like that, uh, specifically for so, some devices. So mm -hmm. I guess the answer is no, uh, there is no guideline as far as I know. So there, there, the next question is, thanks for the presentation. It was really informative. Will the slides be posted? I believe they will be. Um, the next one is, is there anything about trusted firmware that uh, can be integrated into IDEs through plugins? Um, so I'm not I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm assuming this means um, can you like uh, use Eclipse or something like that when you develop trusted firmware code uh, that can automatically build the code or something like that? Um, what's your take on, on this one, uh, Jonah? How do you understand the question? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if there's any special TFA support for IDEs. You know, I, we don't develop any particular plugins. Um, but we, you know, people can use IDEs in their development um, uh, of TFA, and a number of folks do. Um, but the, there's not much, uh, I think. I mean, that that yeah. that is provided as part of the project, at least. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the last question, I believe, is: uh, Is EL2 execution mandatory to use SPM? Um, so SPM, I mean. SPM will really uh, reach its full power when you're using secure YEL2. Uh, that's for sure. 
Uh, now we realize that uh, some platforms, uh, I mean, before MV8.4, they don't have secure YAL2 and they might still want uh, to use SPM. Uh, so that is possible. Uh, there is a migration path, but it's really not um, the main use case we are targeting. Uh, so there will be uh, limitations, um, but it's not strictly mandatory. Uh, but, but if you if you want the, the full power of it, 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 it is it is recommended. Yes. So there, there is the Opti option, Sandrine, isn't there, where the people are using the Opti trusted environment as a as a as an SPM solution that uh, talks all the appropriate uh, APIs. But as you say, that's a migration path to um, um, you know, the the real security L2, whereas um, um, the Opti, of course, is at, at EL1. Yeah, yes. And uh, as we mentioned, Opti, so if uh, you're, you're not aware of that, I mean, that's a, a trusted OS implementation that is uh, open source uh, and available through trustedfirmware.org. And I think we've covered all questions. And run out of time, I think. Yes. Uh, so if you've got any more questions, uh, I encourage you to join us on the Slack channel. So we've been advised to use the uh, number two uh, on the track embedded Linux. So we'll stay uh, for some time if, you go, if you've got any other questions. Thanks a lot, everyone, um, for, for attending and for the questions. Thank you.